Despite the wild sex appeal of steel cutting machines, the surface plate is the tool that any hobby machinist should look forward to congress with the most. Because with the right tool it's where you can really understand what the hell is going on with your parts. Which is why I'm gonna build the coolest surface gauge I can imagine to check parallelism like a king and finally being able to compare squareness. There are two main parts to this build. The first is the dial test indicator holder, which I largely stole from Stefan Gottenswinter's squareness comparator design. And the other is the base, which is my own design, and it comes with a flexure hinge for adjustment and a bumper for squareness. Nothing groundbreaking really, but I did my best to make it as compact as possible to save pressure real estate on my surface plate. Wait, does it rhyme? Let's begin by making the main body of the base, which starts as a block of cold roll steel 35 by 35 by 80 millimeters. The first operation, as you do, is to square up the stock, and I really like the Tom Lipton's way. After the first four cuts, you just put the piece up without worrying it of being square and skim off a straight edge, so when you turn the piece around, the edge squares the block in the X direction, while the Y's jaws square it on the Y direction. So you can then take your cut and it's square to all faces. Then you just turn the piece around and finish the edge face. It might be slower than other methods, I don't know, but you get a fly cutter finish all around and you don't need a square or a V block or some other tool I don't have, so it's pretty sweet. And when I check for parallelism, which is the only thing I can properly check right now, I am within 10 microns on all three sides. That's pretty sweet too. Next, there's a whole lot of material to remove, which involves a roughing end mill, a DIY fog buster and a respirator because my mistless systems wasn't mistless at all until I got the airflow just right. Then I switched to a regular end mill for the finishing pass and the first weird thing happened aka the end mill grabbed the metal while taking a 10 micron pass which theoretically shouldn't be possible and left this horrible scar behind. I thought it was weird but according to the DRO my position was right so I went along. Unaware of the horrible wobble of that centering bit you are seeing right now which turned into drilling way out of position but I was able to savage the operation and straight things up with an end mill and the boring head eventually. But something was very, very wrong. You gotta love how sometimes machining becomes an old noir detective story. My first explanation was that I had simply made a mistake indicating the part, which wasn't the case, but I didn't know, so I retook my references and kept going. I cut the relief for the slitting saw which came out marginally asymmetrical but pretty fine overall. And then I proceeded cutting the slit for the flexor spring and this time it was perfect. So I pushed forward with the renewed confidence in my mediocre skills and I drilled the threaded blind holes for the spring set screws and the slot for the bumper dovetail. And nothing is where it's supposed to be. This slot isn't in the center and the holes are all shifted around. Either this piece of steel is cursed or I am, because I've been so careful to do everything. It turns out I'm an idiot. See this screw? This screw was supposed to keep in place the excess skip, a task surprisingly hard to fulfill while laying forgotten on the base of the machine. But it's not all my fault. This milling machine has a rectilinear dysfunction. The Z-axis is wider on the top, a problem that the manufacturer brilliantly solved installing a loose gib, leaving the head slopping forward one whole tenth of a millimeter. A problem that I temporarily solved with a dirty shimming job on the gib. But what about the X-axis? Well, I removed the X-axis screw to show the difference between the two gibs during a video call with the manufacturer that was trying to bullshit me about the gib being perfectly fine. In the end, they'll send a new gib, but I foresee a complete teardown of this machine in the future to fix some deep structural problems because when the gib is tightened properly, the head binds past this point. That being said, I'm still an idiot because now the part is crap and I can't blame it on the machine like I usually do. At that point, I had no choice but to hit the base with a reset hammer and start over. 
But on a positive note, with the machine tight and trimmed once again, remaking the base is not that bad, and it feels really good to see things finally coming together according to the print. The next operation is to cut my very first dovetail. But I'd like a tight fit, so it would be nice to have the mating dovetail at hand, just to be sure. So I'd need to make the bumper first, but i like it to be hardened tool steel, and unfortunately I don't have tool steel at hand or any hardening equipment. However, I heard that if you put the print in front of a mirror and whisper the name of the sponsor of this video three times, a solution should present itself. Yep, luckily for me, PCBWay is still sponsoring the channel and they offer 5-axis machining, metal 3D printing, wire, EDM, even laser cutting and bedding for fabrication. They work fast and they ship even faster. And their services are very easy to access. You just go on the website, drag and drop any 3D model you have at hand, choose the material, upload drawings and add any extra specification, and then the system immediately gives you a ballpark price that you will later discuss with one of their consultants. And once it's all set and done, you can easily follow the production process step by step directly from the website. So check them out if you need some part you can't make yourself and see if they're a good fit. Sadly, I am not a good fit because despite having a perfect master, I managed to overshot the dovetail anyways. But it's okay, because it wasn't critical for the functionality, just for my pride. To finish this piece, I used the ball end mill to cut a side pocket on both sides to make it nicer to handle and to make it a bit sexier than a plain square block of steel. After that, a round corner for aesthetics, and it's done. Next on the machining table is the fine adjustment, which is just a piece of stock that fits in the base, with a matching slitting cut for the spring, a countersunk hole for the screw that will hold the pole, and an M6 threaded hole for the fine adjustment screw. I then cut a nice relief angle for some aesthetic, and this piece too is done, and surprisingly fast. Now for the heart of the build, the dial test indicator holder. This has to keep the dial test indicator at 45 degrees over the edge of the bumper to compare squareness, but I also want to take full advantage of this handy articulated stem my dial test indicator has and mount it all the way out to be able to check parallelism on small pieces. The first step here is to mill the stock to size, which in retrospect was a mistake, I should have used the band saw because there was a lot of material to remove, but you know, live and learn. Then I start spot drilling the locations for the central pole and the relief hole for the dial test indicator flexure holder and then I drill them open and finish with the boring head. Next, I turn the piece on the side, find the edges and drill the two holes for the locking screws. Now for the fun part. First, I cut off that corner at 45 degrees to accommodate the dovetail where the dial test indicator will sit to compare squareness. And this is the critical dovetail because if the dial test indicator sits all wobbly, uh, the only thing I can compare is my own incompetence. So, I first cut an entry channel with a small carbide end mill, and then I come in with a teeny tiny dovetail cutter using a step over of 0.2mm and taking my sweet time. And it worked pretty well. In fact, I'd be lying if I told you that looking at this fit didn't make my blood flow in all kinds of directions. Unfortunately, it would have been nice to keep some oxygen up in the brain because of what you're about to see. There you go. That little dance right there, that was the drill bit desperately trying to tell me something. No! Moran! Stop! You ground off my point ten years ago! Whoops, I kinda missed that detail. I even rimmed the hole to 4mm thinking there was something left to rim. Uh, the result is that the 3.8mm drill bit dents itself a hole of 4.5mm, but I went on, cutting the rest of the relief for both flexures and slicking the front open, you know, hoping I could still pinch the stem of the dial test indicator despite everything. And I actually could, but I knew I would have hated that fit for the rest of my life, so as painful as it was, this was only one right thing to do. The second time around I used the saw to cut the stock to size and I actually made some improvement in the design to have the front clamp less stiff and to make the shape flow better with the base. I even used a drill bit with a point this time. 
Here I didn't have much surface to index the piece flat on the parallels when slit in the back, so I used the dial test indicator to sweep these two faces parallel to the machine table. Which leaves us with the pole that I tried to order online already ground on the right size, but the first time I didn't get it, and the second time they sent this. I mean, it's the right diameter, but as for the length, I don't want my surface gauge to have virility issues, so I can't use this. A buddy of mine in a pinch procured me a piece of 20 mm stainless, which I then proceeded to turn down to 16 mm, making the best of what I had. And honestly, it would not have been that bad if I had a way to mitigate the flexing and shattering coming from that massive stick out. Instead, I ended up with this Freddy Krueger finish, so my shaft turning project turned into a woodworking project in steel, with a lot of file work and sandpaper to try savaging the situation. And the end result looks pretty nice, but don't let the appearance fool ya, there is still a one tenth of a millimeter drop off in the middle that the clamp of the dial test indicator doesn't like that much. Not exactly glory worth, but it will do until I get a proper shaft in the mail. Next, I cut the spring from a bodywork spatula. Last thing on the list is to drill the fine adjustment screw and press a ball bearing in, so it will ride against the ball bearing pressed in the base on a single point of contact between hardened surfaces, which should result in a pretty damn smooth adjustment. To handle the screws without tools, I designed these nice knobs and had my friends at PCBWay sculpt them from stainless steel, because at the end of the day the knobs are the part you interact with the most, and I'd like it to be nice. And to keep the screw and the knob together, I just used the gem set screw from the back, which works perfectly fine. I also had some axial bearing on the clamping screws, because they give that extra bit of smoothness that makes it feel premium. And with all pieces done, it's time to turn off the brain for a few hours and give each of them a nice round of deburring and sanding for a decent from afar finish. Fun fact, 10 years ago I used to hate sanding by hand more than anything in the world, but now I just find it weirdly soothing and relaxing. It could be wisdom, but it's probably brain damage. Seriously, I could sand all day if sandpaper was cheaper. And to finish things up, I wanted a bit of zazz on this thing, so I tried cold blue. Which didn't get me fantastic initial results while trying to brush the stuff off, but in the end, after soaking the parts completely in the blue solution and a night with some oil on it, the final look is not too shabby. Now the best part, putting everything together for the first time. I won't say it's as good as kissing the girl you like for the first time, because it would be a bit too much, but it could be the discount version of that. And well, if this is not a pretty sexy piece of metal, I don't know what is. I love the fitting of the dial test indicator, I love the knobs, the fine adjustments is super smooth, despite the screw being looser than I would have liked, but most of all, it's very nice being finally able to measure squareness, considering it's 33.33333% of the flat, square and parallel battle of machining.